In this video, I will be discussing how to use ultrasound imaging of the spine in patients with degenerative scoliotic deformities. Familiarity with the basics of ultrasound imaging of the normal spine is required to maximize the usefulness of this technique. First, some general principles. Remember that the purpose of ultrasound imaging is to better delineate the underlying anatomy. With this, we identify a potential soft tissue window for needle insertion into the epidural or intrathecal space. This is particularly important where the anatomy cannot be discerned or where it has become distorted. Finally, it is important to note that even after we have found a suitable soft tissue window, good fundamental needle handling is essential for successful completion of the procedure. As with all patients, we start with a parasagittal oblique view. The probe is placed in a longitudinal orientation and angled towards the midline to direct the beam through the interlaminar windows. What you expect to see are these characteristic sawtooth-like shadows which are the laminae of the lumbar vertebrae. Adjust the probe with small sliding and tilting motions to visualize the anterior complex which is located about 2 cm deep to the base of the saw teeth or lamina in most adult patients. The first thing to remember about the scoliotic patient is that the deformity is usually S-shaped and there are therefore two curves. The thoracic one is usually most obvious, but remember that the lumbar curve is likely to be in the opposite direction. The second thing to remember is that there is always a rotational element associated with a lateral curve. The vertebral body is rotated towards the convex side of the curve and the spinous process is rotated towards the concave side of the curve. The best mnemonic that I can come up with to remember this is Bovex and SPAVE. And if anyone has a better one, please leave it in the comments. As you can see, what this means is that in a midline approach between two spinous processes, the needle has to be angled towards the convex side of the curve. The interlaminar spaces are widest on the convex side of the curve. Therefore, if using a paraspinous or paramedian approach, insert the needle on the convex side, but the needle direction is often perpendicular to the skin rather than angled as we usually do. This will be illustrated later in some examples. A parasagittal oblique scan should be done on both sides of the spine. This will usually reveal narrower spaces on the concave side and wider spaces on the convex side. The width of the space is indicated by the gap between adjacent laminae and also how easy it is to visualize the anterior complex. This gives further clues about the presence of a scoliosis and which way the curves might be going. It is important to assess all the spaces from L23 down to L5S1 as one interlaminar space may be wider than the others. This next video illustrates this. As we start scanning from the L5S1 area, we see that the L45 space is very narrow with no visible anterior complex. A small anterior complex is seen at the L3-4 space making it a possible option. But the widest and easiest space to visualize in excess in the patient is L23. This is later confirmed on the transverse midline views at the different levels. Note that the classic repeating sawtooth pattern of the parasagittal oblique view may not be seen in scoliosis because of the rotation of the spine. When the vertebrae rotate on each other, the ultrasound beam may now cut through an articular process rather than the lamina. This will be evident by a rounded shadow rather than the sawtooth shaped one and is yet another clue that scoliosis is present. This underscores the importance of learning to recognize normal anatomy. Having identified and assessed the interlaminar spaces in the parasagittal oblique view, the location of these spaces is marked on the skin. The next step is to turn the probe into a transverse orientation where one of two views is obtained. The first is the spinous process view where the bony spinous process and lamina produce this characteristic acoustic shadow which looks a little bit like a church steeple with a hyperechoic reflection at the tip of the spinous process. Shifting the probe cranially or cordally 
will bring the beam into the interlaminar space where there is now no bone between the probe and the vertebral canal. So we will see the anterior complex appear and sometimes, but not always, the posterior complex. In this plane, we will also see the articular process and transverse process shadows. The transverse view is essential in identifying rotation. Note how, although the probe is placed perpendicular to the patient's back, the acoustic shadow of the spinous process is tilted to one side. This is what is happening. The spine is rotated, and if this is not recognized, and the needle is inserted perpendicularly between two spinous processes in a presumed midline approach, it will contact the articular process and facet joint on one side. This usually elicits pain that is localized to one side and is a clue that there may be rotational scoliosis during a surface landmark guided approach. The beauty of ultrasound is that we can rotate or angle our probe to bring the beam into line with the axis of the spine. And thus we determine the angle of rotation and consequently the angle of insertion for our needle. So having noticed that the spinous process shadow is tilted when the probe is perpendicular to the surface of the back, we angle the probe towards one side or the other to bring the shadow into a vertical position. This then is the angle at which the needle should be inserted for a midline approach to the vertebral canal. Here is another example. I am now going to present three more patient examples to further illustrate these principles, as well as to introduce a few more tips and tricks. This first patient has an obvious thoracal lumbar scoliosis. We can see that her thoracic scoliosis is convex to the right. The lumbar scoliosis is less evident, but the principle of the S-curve tells us that it is convex to the left and that the interlaminar spaces will be wider and more open on the left as a result. This video shows the parasagittal oblique scan obtained on the patient's left side. I generally always start over the sacrum, which is recognizable by its flat, linear, hyperechoic appearance. As the probe is shifted and angled medially, a break appears. This is actually the first sacral foramina, not the L5-S1 intervertebral space. This is the L5-S1 space, with the L5 lamina sawtooth shadow clearly visible. L4-5 and L3-4 are all decent sized spaces with clearly visible anterior complexes. However, a parasagittal oblique view of the L2-3 space is much harder to obtain in this patient as this is where her curve is maximal. This is the transverse view at the L2-3 level with the probe perpendicular to the surface of the back. The spinous process shadow is clearly tilted with the body rotating towards the left or the convex side of the curve and the spinous process is rotated towards the right and the concave side of the curve. Rocking the probe to tilt it towards the left shoulder brings the neuraxial midline into the vertical. An interspinous view has also been obtained with the anterior complex clearly visible, indicating that we have an open midline window at this level. Note the angle of the probe, which indicates the angle of needle insertion at this level with a midline approach. At the end of the day, however, we chose to go at the L4-5 level in this patient as the space was wider and there was not as much rotation of the spine. Patient 2 was a lady who presented for a total hip replacement and insisted on having a spinal anesthetic despite the presence of severe degenerative scoliosis. Once again, you can see that she has a typical S-curve with a thoracic scoliosis convex to the left and the lumbar scoliosis convex to the right, with the apex of the curve at L4, 5, and L5, S1. Plain x-rays, if available, give a lot of useful information and should be reviewed. Assessment of the parasagittal oblique views on the right, where we expect to find the wider spaces, shows that the L5, S1 space is almost completely closed and an anterior complex cannot be visualized. Note again the potentially misleading appearance of the first sacral foramen, which can mimic the L5-S1 junction. The L4-5 space in this patient was wider, although still narrow compared to a normal spine. Nevertheless, the anterior complex is visible, signifying a potential window into the vertebral canal.
The transverse view at the L4-5 level is very interesting and is something we often see in patients with more severe degrees of scoliosis. The anterior complex is located to one side of the spinous process shadow, in this case the right side. We know that this is the anterior complex because it is a shadow located at the same depth as the anterior complex in the parasagittal oblique view. What we are seeing is a paramedian view into the vertebral canal with the ultrasound beam traveling vertically into the canal and back out again. This means that we can insert a needle perpendicular to the patient's back directly in line with the anterior complex and it will penetrate the epidural or intrathecal space. I have used this approach in many patients successfully. Our third patient also had a significant degree of lumbar scoliosis. I will not be showing the parasagittal oblique scan but this was done in the usual fashion to count levels and to assess the width of spaces as described earlier. As the video of the transfer scan shows, there is significant rotational element to her curve. This is brought into the vertical by appropriate rotation and angling of the probe. The probe is slid cranially and caudally to locate an anterior complex, which signifies an open window into the canal. We see this here, but like our second patient, the anterior complex is visible lateral to the spinous process shadow of the midline, ML, and can be accessed by a paraspinous PS approach. The location of this transverse plane and the corresponding positions of the midline and paraspinous line are marked on the patient's back. The intended insertion point is at the intersection of the paraspinous line and the horizontal plane of the beam, in line with the visible anterior complex. I have also marked the position of the spinous process above the space with the hatch rectangle to give me an additional guiding landmark should I encounter difficulty and need to make redirections. Finally, I have found it helpful, particularly for trainees with patients in the sitting position, to mark the angle of the probe and the degree of rotation on the surface of the bed to provide guidance for needle redirection. As expected, a 25 gauge needle inserted perpendicular to the patient's back enters the space successfully in a single pass. Note that this corresponds to the sketch that was made during the scanning process. In summary, when scanning patients with known or suspected scoliosis, remember that they usually have two curves with the lumbar curve being less obvious. Always assess both the left and right sides in the parasagittal oblique view there is a degree of rotation that accompanies a lateral curve, and this can be identified either by unilateral and localized back pain when the needle is inserted in the midline, or more simply, by using ultrasound and looking for the spinous process shadow to be tilted off to one side. Midline needle insertion should be angled in the same way that the ultrasound beam is angled to make the shadow vertical. In contrast, a paramedian or paraspinous approach often involves a needle trajectory that is perpendicular to the back. If the interlaminar windows in the midline are narrowed, a paraspinous approach is usually successful as long as the anterior complex is visualized and aimed for. Remember that careful skin marking and needle handling is paramount for success. And finally, learning to scan and recognize the normal spine is essential to interpret the images in patients with more difficult anatomy.